Hi, welcome. Welcome to Washington, D.C. My name is Kathleen Pearl. I serve as the Director of Outreach here at Museum of the Bible. It is such a pleasure on behalf of the leadership and our entire museum team to welcome you to this virtual tour. And we do hope that you can visit us in person just as soon as, as it is safe to travel again. Um, we have a really great lineup for you. A select members of our curatorial team are positioned inside the museum and will be giving great presentations. And then afterward, we will have time for questions. We'll have an opportunity to do some Q&A. Um, with us today inside, we will um, be presented by Dr. Jeff Kloa, who is the museum's chief curatorial officer. We will also hear from Ms. Rena Opert, who serves as our director of exhibits and collections specialist. And additionally, we will hear from Dr. Jesse Abelman, who is the museum's curator outside at the museum. Um, the museum's narrative begins before before guests even step foot in the door. As you will see, these 40-foot bronze panels and the very beautiful golden centerpiece artwork are not only representative of special moments in time of the history of the Bible, but they are also inspired by actual artifacts you can see on our displays. And the train that you're hearing actually I wanted to touch on that because this building was not built to be a museum. It was built in the early 1920s and it was Washington DC's first refrigerated warehouse. And those large railway trains would be pulled into this entrance and the, the goods were kept cool, offloaded and distributed around Washington DC. The museum acquired the building and did an extensive renovation. So not only is it beautiful, it's educational, and it also is very safe and secure for the museum's collections and artifacts inside. So let's go. And this panel that you're looking at right here is inspired by one of our artifacts in the collection, the Bogmer Papyri, which dates to the third and fourth century AD. And as you'll see here, it's very beautiful, but the 16 panels are actually translated into different languages. And really that serves as a beacon to welcome everyone, that everyone is welcome. All ages, demographics, everywhere in the world is welcome here at the museum. As we go through this portion, I should mention that the video may get a little bit choppy and that's okay, just stay with it. If we have any technical difficulties with that, Our Zoom host, Allison Mullins. Okay, we're gonna pause here for just a moment, so hopefully the video will connect again. And as you can see, what I want to mention is as guests are greeted into and they come into the main space, the interpretive strategy is seen from the floor all the way up to the ceiling. Um, as you enter the building, on the floor we have these beautiful tiles. And one of the recurring themes of the Bible, of course, is from darkness into light. And as guests go from the entrance and they travel down towards the entrance of the exhibition area, you'll notice that the, the floor tiles go from dark to light. And so by the time you reach the entrance of the exhibitions, all of the floor tiles are white. I should also mention that the beautiful limestone um, uh, columns are actually limestone imported from Jerusalem. And of course, the beautiful sweeping view above us, it's 40 feet up and 140 feet long. And it rotates beautiful images all day of magnificent architectural structures, uh, images of nature, illuminated Bibles and other script, biblical script. And so really what we want to impress upon you is everything is purposeful and supports our mission. And our mission is to engage all people with the history, the stories, and the impact of the Bible. And without further ado, we're going to hand off to our Chief Curatorial Officer, Dr. Jeff Loa. Good, af <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the museum. Uh, my name is Jeff again, and it's uh, an honor to be uh, meeting with you virtually and we hope to be able to welcome you in person uh, someday. 
What I'll do is walk you through a bit of our uh, themes in the museum educationally, uh, some of the programming that we have, a little bit of our structure, so you have an understanding of that, and then uh, our collections and research focus as a museum. As Kathleen mentioned, we really focus uh, as an educational institution on the history of the Bible, the impact of the Bible, and the kind of the basic stories of the Bible. So all of our exhibits, both permanent exhibits and our special exhibits, our programming, will relate to those three themes. Uh, the key points in our mission, uh, you might pick out three words especially. As Kathleen mentioned, invite is a really uh, key focus for us. We want this museum to be accessible and open to people of all faith traditions and no faith tradition. Uh, so we do that by focusing on those three areas and not focusing on things like uh, theology or uh, individual faith traditions perspectives or interpretations, but again on the history of the Bible, the basic stories of the Bible, and the impact of the Bible in America and around the world. The second key part of our mission statement is engage. So the museum was designed not so much as a passive space, but to be very interactive, uh, multi-sensory, experiential. Uh, so we have a mix of very traditional style exhibitions, which is uh, where I'm standing right now, for example, but also a great deal of interactivity and multimedia uh, experiences uh, to highlight different themes in the Bible. And the third uh, focus, of course, is the Bible itself. Uh, what's really exciting about our mission and the opportunity that we have as a museum is we have about 4,000 years of history of cultures interacting with the Bible. And virtually every culture on earth has some history with the Bible. So uh, there's really no end of topics and opportunities to help our guests see the wide ranging and significant impact that the Bible has had and continues to have throughout the world and even on individual people. A couple of uh, goals that we've had in designing our exhibitions and programs are, are kind of twofold. We definitely want to take an approach that's academically reliable and that uh, will be uh, acceptable to you know, a, a general audience, but also reliable academically. So verified, we have a team of scholars that we work with. Uh, for exhibits, we bring in external scholars as advisors uh, with so much history and so much culture. Uh, even though we have a great staff, we can't possibly have expertise in all areas. So for really every project, we bring in external consultants from a wide range of backgrounds. And again, the engaging piece is extremely important to us. Uh, even in a traditional gallery like this, you'll see video, you'll see uh, large images, you'll see interactivity so that people can uh, go a little bit more in depth than simply walking past an artifact case. The, uh, the three permanent exhibits in the museum are focused on the history, stories, and impact of the Bible. And we're really only gonna be able to see the history exhibit today, which is where a lot of the artifacts that uh, will relate to your museum are located. We also do uh, a large number of partnerships with other museums and cultural institutions around the world. This particular exhibit is a long-term partnership with the Israel Antiquities Authority up here on our fifth floor. And on our ground floor, we also have an exhibit long-term relationship with the Vatican Museums and Library. Uh, so we work with numerous international partners, uh, both for permanent exhibits, for loans of individual artifacts, as well as for special exhibits that we run uh, throughout the year. And you'll hear about that from Rena. As far as our structure, uh, we're set up as a uh, independent nonprofit organization. So we're not connected to any uh, government entity. 
Uh, we're not connected to the Smithsonian's, even though we're just two blocks from the mall and from the Air and Space Museum here in DC. But we have our own uh, board. Uh, the organization was founded about, well, actually about 10 years ago. And the museum opened uh, three years ago. So it's kind of up to us, I have to say, to, uh, to make our own money. Uh, and we do that through a combination of earned revenue in, in ticketing and gift shop and those kinds of things, and especially uh, donor support. And we're really grateful for the strong donor support, uh, especially during these days of COVID, uh, when we were closed for three months and now have been opened with uh, limited capacity and limited especially by the uh, limits on tourism in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, so we're looking forward to, uh, to things being opened again very, very soon. Uh, we have about 250 employees and uh, we run uh, uh, kind of five departments. We don't really need to get into that unless you'd like to Q&A later on. Um, but a pretty complex organization uh, in a very large space of about 430,000 square feet uh, here in the museum. A few notes about our collection, uh, artifact collection. Uh, the museum itself owns about 16,000 artifacts, and we also, uh, by contract, curate three other private collections uh, that we're allowed to exhibit and, and, and highlight in our, in our programs, which gives us about uh, 50 to 55,000 artifacts in total that we can use in our exhibits. Uh, on display at any one time are about 4,000 artifacts, both from our collection and from various lenders. The collection is very strong in, uh, well, really starting with ancient Christianity, uh, some of the earliest biblical papyri and uh, uh, parchment manuscripts, but then especially into the medieval period, both uh, Christian and Jewish artifacts, and you'll hear quite a bit from uh, Jesse and Herschel about our uh, Eudaica and Hebraica collections. And then once you get to uh, Gutenberg, we have a very early Gutenberg Bible, and then into the early modern and modern period, uh, very strong collection, including in Americana, uh, medical history, science and faith history. So a collection that's not only exhibitable, but also very strong for research opportunities uh, in addition. Uh, our research program is perhaps a little more extensive than a lot of museums. We have what we call the Scholars Initiative. And through that, we fund archeological projects in Israel. We have two currently that we're funding. We fund research projects, some of them longer term organizational projects. Some are individual research projects. We sponsor publications, academic publications. We sponsor digitizing projects at collections around the world that are at risk in various ways. Uh, so we, we try to support uh, cultural heritage preservation and uh, the academic side of things, as well as uh, the museum itself, which is a bit more popular and for the general public. Our programs, public programs, of course, have shifted a bit during the time of COVID, uh, but we do a range of programming from uh, school age programs, homeschool and family programming, uh, to some more academic kind of program. Uh, tonight, for example, we have a lecture. Uh, actually, it's by one of the archaeological projects that we sponsor. And he'll be talking about that excavation up in Galilee, uh, where he's looking for the site of ancient uh, Roman Bethsaida. Uh, so kind of a broad sweep. And we try to have our programming and our museum be accessible and have a reach, not only here in Washington, DC, uh, but also beyond through our online resources and our partnerships uh, with organizations around the world. So we look forward to discussing with you what that might look like uh, as you grow your museum. And with that, I'll pass it over to Rena Opert, who will talk about our special exhibition program. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, it's me, Kathleen, again. Um, the noise outside made it a little bit difficult to communicate. And before we pass it to Rena, I did want to put out a mention of special thank you 
to David Hatchwell. Um, through him and his longtime colleague, Rina, or I'm sorry, Rivka, who is a close friend of the museum, that's who made this, uh, this virtual visit possible. So we want to do a, a very special thanks and gratitude to David. And with that, this is our director of exhibits, Rina Oper. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Kathleen and Jeff. It's really nice to be able to speak with all of you today. And I look forward to our question and answer session as well. Um, I am actually standing in one of our temporary galleries where, unfortunately, we just ended this exhibit, but it's really wonderful and I wanted to share it with you. The exhibit is called A Fence Around the Torah, and it featured one very special artifact from our collection that we named the Washington Pentateuch. The Washington Pentateuch is a complete manuscript, biblical manuscript from approximately the year 1000 and it is one of the oldest most complete and most important Jewish manuscripts in the United States and one of only a handful like it around the world which would include the Aleppo Codex and a few others and so this exhibit took the opportunity to number one unveil the manuscript to the public it had been in a private collection for over 200 years and so scholars and the public hadn't had an opportunity to see it or study it. And so by putting it on display, it actually highlights one of the principles of this museum, which is to promote access to all of our collections, which we do, of course, through exhibits and also through our online collections page. And this exhibit um, was small, but we were able to focus only on this artifact and tell its um, story and its history, which was quite fascinating. And we actually have a series of exhibits um, called An Artifact in Focus, where we really delve into one topic very deeply. And so this is an example of um, the kinds of outcomes we're looking for when we do temporary exhibits. There are a few things we like to do. One is to attract new audiences and diverse audiences. So of course, different topics are gonna attract different groups of people. And this one helped introduce new people to our museum. It also helps us form partnerships, which I know Jeff has mentioned as well, um, both with external scholars who lend their expertise. So we worked with David Stern, who is an expert in these manuscripts, um, and with other institutions. And so um, this one really helped us achieve both of those. Um, we do about four now major exhibits a year in our temporary galleries. So this space is small, it's about 200 square meters, but we have um, exhibit spaces upstairs that are over 600. So we do a range of sizes. We also work both with um, internal curators and external scholars, internal designers, and also um, outsourced to external design firms. And what our temporary exhibits allow us to do are a few things. We can focus on topics that highlight the history, narrative, and impact of the Bible, just like our three main floors. But we can either dive in to topics very um, closely, like we do here, or introduce new topics that even with all our space, we can't cover in our spaces. And so for example, upstairs, we have a very large exhibit of um, Renaissance oil paintings that show um, the history of how art used to and still does help us interpret biblical stories and ideas. We are also um, working this year on a number of different partnerships and exhibits that we're co-curating. So one very exciting one is we're working on um, an exhibit that'll show um, the Bible in Armenia. And we're working with the Armenian government and with um, their religious leaders. We're working with um, other institutions, as Jeff mentioned, on other exhibits, we have the Vatican, we have the IAA. And so we use these exhibits to really um, develop partnerships and to share our scholarship with the world. And most importantly, um, every exhibit here, no matter the topic, no matter the topic, um, always has to be immersive and engaging so that our public will both come to learn but also be engaged, feel that they are participating in the topic. So we use technology um, as much as we can. We have hands-on interactives. 
we really try to engage um, our public in a variety of ways so that the topic sticks with them. So I look forward to discussing more about this program in our Q&A, um, but I want to now introduce you to um, our curator of Hebraica and Judaica, Dr. Jesse Abelman, and he will be up in our uh, fourth floor history of the Bible area. Thank you. The video? Okay, I don't see how to do that. I see video. Are we going? There we go. Yep, you're good. Uh, hi, thanks so much, Rena. That was wonderful. Um, you find me here on the fourth floor of the museum, what we call the history floor, which tells the story of the original sort of context in which the Bible, Bible was composed and then its transmission and reception throughout time uh, from the very beginning up until the present day. Um, and unfortunately, you know, under better circumstances, I'd walk you through and show you the floor and, and tell you that story. But today we're just going to do talk. I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, special objects in our Judaica collection, special, special books, and then talk a little bit about how we promote research and access to these items, to these objects. So first of all, over here, what we have is what's called Codex Valmadonna I, after the uh, collection in which it, of which it used to be a part of, um, the Valmadonna collection, one of the uh, largest and most significant uh, historical collections of Jewish uh, manuscripts and print books. And Valmadonna I is an absolutely unique book. It is a Humash, a Pentateuch. Uh, it contains the five books of Moses uh, designed for sort of liturgical use, right? It would have been used in a synagogue. Um, so that means it has, it has not only the text of the Humash and the Parshiot, uh, the Torah portions for the Sabbath, it also, it also has the uh, Haftarot, uh, the passages of the prophets, the meme that are read every week. Um, and the Megillot, which are read on, on certain holidays, et cetera, right? Um, but what makes it so special because, right, you can walk into any synagogue and find a printed Humash on the shelf, right, with all of that stuff in it. What makes it so special is that it is the only dated Hebrew manuscript written in England in the Middle Ages. And it's dated to the year 1189 end of the 12th century, about 100 years before the Jews were expelled from England, um, uh, where they weren't allowed to live for several centuries after that. Um, and right, it's, it's, it's a beautiful book. It's a monument um, to what that Jewish community of England can produce. Um, and it was made, day was finished, was, it was finished in July 1189. Just three months later um, began the first set of, um, uh, of persecutions um, and massacres of the Jews of England uh, that would plague them up until their expulsion a century later. And I think part of what this sort of um, is a testament to is the um, sort of creative life and thriving um, that throughout history, um, the Jewish people has managed to, um, has managed, has, has, has excelled at, um, alongside some of the horrible things that, of course, uh, happen. And moving on now to, to another uh, beautiful, beautiful work. Um, we have a very old, don't know the exact date, but 13th, 14th century um, Torah scroll um, written in the Sephardic Spanish style. This is you know, very close to the heart of, of what your museum is going to do, of course. Um, it's, if, as you probably could tell from that date, right? it was written before uh, the later expulsion, the more famous expulsion of, of Jews from Spain in 1492. Um, and uh, we don't know if it was actually written in Spain or if it was written by a scribe who was trained in the Spanish style, um, you know, perhaps in North Africa, um, right? There were, there were famous, famous communities of Sephardic exiles um, even before the mass exile of the, um, of the, 13th, of the uh, 15th century, excuse me. Um, but it's, this is also just, it's, it's a, first of all, it's, it's beautifully written. 
Um, it's very unique. It has all kinds of uh, unusual features which you will not find in Torah scrolls today. Um, and it too, right, it's a, it's a, it's a testament um, to the community that created it. And it's not, it includes panels from later time periods. Um, and then we don't know the exact history of how those, how those came to be attached to it, but it, it, it tells a story of, uh, of people in a community that moved around and brought, brought their Torah with them, right? Both their physical Torah, the object itself, but also, you know, Torah in a broader sense, right? The um, uh, um, teachings and um, laws and customs and, and, and practice of study um, that has been so dear to the Jewish people for so long. Um, so we have a very large collection of Torah scrolls in general, Sifrei Torah, um, and we are currently, to sort of follow up on what Rena was saying about access and research, um, we are currently in the middle of a project to catalog, digitize, um, and make available uh, all of those Torah scrolls, all of those Sifrei Torah uh, on, on the internet uh, to be seen and made available for people everywhere um, so that we can both uh, promote research, people can better understand the history of the development of the construction and writing of Sifrei Torah, as well as um, the uh, um, particular uh, details of the text of the Bible, text of the Torah, and it's the layout of Sifrei Torah, et cetera, all of those various things. Um, there's already been some research done uh, with our, with our, with our Sifrei Torah um, that you can find. Um, happy to talk about that more if people are interested later during the Q&A. Um, I think I'm, I'm running low on time, so uh, I'm gonna kick you over to someone who you know well and who probably needs no introduction, uh, David Hatchwell, um, and I'll speak to you soon. Uh, excited for the Q&A and to get to actually talk to some of you. Thanks. Okay, perfect. That was great. Hello? Okay, I guess, can you hear me? Yes? Can someone make a sign with a head? We can okay, hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. So, well, first, first of all, thank you all. Thank you, Jeff, Kathleen, Rina, Jesse, and of course, Rivka Kidron for giving us the opportunity to have a taste of the Bible Museum. Um, many of us have heard of the institution and uh, I had the privilege years ago, thanks also to Rivka, to get to meet uh, the family behind this dream. And um, it's a family of Christians living in the United States, people of faith, that decided that they had to leave their dream of leaving an incredible testimony and a legacy uh, of what the, the Bible is all about to the world. And uh, as proof of generosity, they did this incredible project. And I thought that this would be really exciting for us, for the Fundación Hispano Julia, for several reasons. First of all, because of the topic, obviously, because we're talking about the Bible and this is obviously where we have our values and traditions coming from. But secondly, because of the, the attitude, it's important uh, that uh, we remain on course in terms of what we believe in and specifically about the way to see our uh, inheritance, our traditions and our values as being something that we can share and that diversity makes us, makes us much stronger. So I love the fact that uh, the Green family was the one that established this amazing uh, museum and that there can be lots of ways to collaborate from here onward. I wanna just uh, add something before we pass to the Q&A side of, of today, which is that uh, we are, uh, first of all, a foundation that was born uh, recently. This, we only have uh, six years of age, and I was listening to the explanations as uh, a young kid looking as he, at his uh, older brother and looking at the full blown and grown adult next to, to him and saying, you know, how much I wish we will be able to develop and learn from what you have done already. So that's, first of all, uh, a message to tell you that we, we definitely would love to emulate you in your success and definitely in terms of the journey of the values that we want to, to expose 
in the Spanish speaking world than were Spanish speaking and uh, Jewish meat. No? And secondly, to tell you also that within the many undertakings that we've had over the last years, uh, we have uh, done things already with specific Bibles. Uh, and um, I'm referring specifically to the Kennicott Bible, the very famous Oxford owned Bible from uh, La Coruña originally that we brought uh, through and thanks also to the government of Galicia, of the region of Spain, last year to Spain. And it's been uh, once in a lifetime. So we're very, very excited about that and very proud of having participated in this undertaking. And secondly, also that uh, we're right now also discussing with uh, the House of Alba uh, for the possibility of the Bible of Alba, which is also a magnificent uh, Bible, the first translation from Hebrew to Castilian, the Castilian Spanish of the Hebrew Bible. And we're discussing also with the House of Alba for uh, the real uh, Bible to, to be part of our museum exhibition. And also on August 22nd, a year and a bit ago, we offered a facsimile specifically of the Bible of Alba to His Holiness uh, Pope Francis. So uh, our foundation is also about Bible in another way, but definitely we're really looking forward to many collaborations ahead in terms of research, exhibitions, uh, lots of programming that we could do together. And uh, we're very, very proud of that. So if I can, I'd like to give also the opportunity to some of the members of, um, of the Zoom to participate. I thought about uh, somebody that I'd love to, to hear. Um, I'll start with uh, Yifat Horowitz, who happens to be a key member of uh, the Association of Friends of the Fundación Hispano Judía in Panama, which is one of the five countries where we have uh, a Friends of Association. And uh, if I, perhaps you want to start uh, with the first salvo of questions. If somebody can unsilence Ifat. Okay. I see I'm getting zero success technologically speaking here. Ifat? Panama? No? Okay, I see Ifat is still silent. So perhaps we can start with Jacob Ben Bunan, who happens to be also uh, an important member of uh, our Fundacion. He's based in Madrid and he's the CEO and founder of one of the world's leading uh, brand uh, management companies, Saffron. Uh, Jacob, uh, perhaps you can uh, shoot a question to start. Oh, sure. Thank you, David, for the uh, uh, lovely introduction of mine. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I mean, I am absolutely impressed, and I uh, by the uh, by the um, uh, by the introduction of the museum that you've given us, and it's uh, and it makes me even more uh, excited to think when will I be able to uh, fly and travel again to DC to be able to spend a few hours there. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I was, I'm, 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 it's, it's, it's obviously quite impressive what one see uh, through the short virtual tour that you've given us. And, it, and, and it's even more impressive to, to, to hear you saying that you spend a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of time and, and, and resources in research to keep the word of God and the Bible alive. One of the questions I'd love to know, because maybe maybe you mentioned it, but I but I didn't get it actually. Well, is is uh, do you do you do you actually focus only on the history of the Bible, or do you also focus on the present and the future of the Bible? What is the impact of the Bible as uh, our world is evolving at the pace it is evolving at the moment? Do you have any uh, any sections dedicated to? Uh, uh, the Bible today and the Bible tomorrow? Great question. I'll, I'll jump in on that. Uh, this is Jeff. Uh, the entire second floor of the museum is dedicated to the impact of the Bible, and uh, it's divided into two sections. Uh, one is the impact of the Bible in America from kind of the first um, uh, immigrants down through basically to the modern day. 
uh, where the Bible intersects with American history. The second half of that exhibit focuses on the Bible and culture. So the impact of the Bible on art, on popular music, on movies, on uh, uh, everyday life, you know, people in their daily work, how the Bible impacts them, uh, family life, um, even uh, politics on some level. So it's tricky, but, uh, you know, popular culture and popular media. Uh, so yes, there is, there is quite a bit of that on the impact floor. And, um, uh, and, and then in our public programming, uh, we'll bring timely topics in. For example, uh, last month was the 100th anniversary of the uh, amendment to the US Constitution that allowed women to vote. So we had a special program of the role of the Bible on, uh, on the suffrage movements. And of course, that gets into uh, modern impact and how that is important today. So it's a combination of uh, what happens in the exhibits and then the opportunities that we have through special programming to highlight uh, ongoing uh, implications. Wow, it's pretty amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah. Great. So let's see if Yifat, if Yifat is uh, unsilenced. No, for some reason, ah, if it cannot be unsilenced. Okay, I just got a message internally. Uh, would anyone want to ask a question now? Yes, uh, is it possible to, yeah, yes, to course, ask a question? Please. Look, okay, look, at yeah. Israel, look at the Israelis. I said one question and you asked now for two. For a few questions. Well, I have actually, <laughs> I have four questions. <laughs> so, so cram it up in one. We, we are good at that. No. Uh, some stats, uh, with your permission. First of all, how many visitors do you have usually? I mean, not, not of course, in this period. It's very curious to me. And second, um, um, uh, we were you were talking about the relevant, uh, relevant issues of the Bible, in what way they are um, engaged to the public. And third, if you may, um, a little bit about the technologies that you say that you have in the museum um, I would like very much to hear about the technologies presented to the public and is there any application developed specifically for the visit great well I'll start with the easy one about the attendance and then ask Rena to talk about the technology side um, so our attendance uh, uh, we opened in November of 2017 and before we closed due to COVID in March, we were right about 2 million visitors overall. Uh, in, uh, in that time frame, we went from a free admission or a donation-based admission in the first year to a paid admission, a ticketed, uh, paid ticket admission, uh, about a year after we opened, a little more than a year later. So that did have a bit of an impact on uh, the attendance uh, but um, uh, it was kind of a financial decision. Although we are in discussions again to see what the trade-offs are and whether we might go back to a, uh, a donation-based admission. So, so uh, and that's our ticketed admission. That doesn't include um, special events or the programs, things like that. That's our kind of paid uh, or uh, guest through the, uh, uh, the ticketing system. So I'll ask Karina to talk about the technology. Hi, so um, for our technology, we have, of course, kind of the expected, you know, a lot of touch screens where um, you can dive into more information um, where different things come up on the screen. Uh, but we are also trying to use technology in more unexpected ways. Um, so we're doing a lot of experimentation in our temporary exhibits that we're working on right now. So a couple examples of that are um, we have one exhibit that's hope hopefully going to open uh, next spring where we're working on interactives that um, encourage people to work collaboratively. So there will be a, you know different areas of this digital and also tactile element where they have to work together to achieve the outcome they're looking for. So we're trying to you know, figure out ways to um, 
to not just have passive experiences, but where people can form community, work together, and be engaged in that way. Um, also, in a different exhibit we're planning that's going to open in February, um, we're working on an interactive that uses mapping technology. So it will look like a big medieval manuscript where you can actually turn the pages of it. But as you turn the pages, um, illustrations will be projected onto it to make it look like a, a medieval manuscript. You'll see the decorative borders, the font. And then all of a sudden it's going to animate and come to life and tell you a story. Um, and it's actually going to um, tell you the story that is told in some letters that we have from medieval times. So we're using primary documents. We're bringing them to life through technology with the digital mapping, but there's also the tactile piece of getting to actually flip the page and have that experience. Um, so we're excited about that as well. We have a number of others that we're working on also, um, and we try to do some prototyping and testing too with the audience and the user experience to make sure that um, ultimately visitors get the experience that we're hoping for out of it. Happy to answer more questions. Thank so, you, thank uh, you very I'd much. Like, I'd like to now give uh, Valerie Gerstein, a founding member of our Association of Friends in New York City and a member of the JFNA, uh, the opportunity to ask a question. Thank you for bringing us together. This is so inspiring because when there's just an idea, it's an idea and this is a beautiful way. I, I have the screen pinned to the virtual tour to be able to see how interactive this is. And Rena, I love what you were just sharing and it sort of goes with the, the question and comment I wanted to share. Our family has said so many times during the, the COVID shutdown in New York City that we feel so blessed that we were able to be in Israel in December. And my, I have um, teenagers, teen and tweens, sixth and eighth grade, and, and they don't always love going to museums, but they really love the Palmach Museum because it kind of looked like what we're seeing right now. It was very interactive, very memorable, very um, experiential. So I think this is definitely inspiring. and. Um, um, also with JFNA, National Young Leadership Cabinet, we went to Russia in the last couple of years and there was also a, a very interactive museum similar to what you're saying, Rena. So I, I am very excited to hear how the collaboration will be with what state-of-the-art immersive and memorable museums are. So count me in to be a thought partner because I, I think what Kathleen said at the very outset was that your museum is for everybody. And so I, I hope that in Madrid, it will be that way too. So my second point that I wanted to bring up is I love seeing the Torah that, that, that is rooted in the Spartac tradition. And I am Ashkenazi American now from Kansas, my kid, raising my kids in New York City. And they go to the Heschel School. And there's been a big discussion when we think about diversity, right? Diversity in the world, but diversity even within Judaism. I'm very curious to know how you're digitizing your research that, that um, you spoke about. I think it was Jesse. How can we think about partnering with schools that tend to deliver an Ashkenazi perspective, right? How do, how do we start to work with what you have, what the plan is in Madrid to say, this is digitized. Even if you can't get yourselves there physically, how can we enhance your curriculum to give our Jewish students um, a broader view of Judaism? Great question. Um, I, I might have a uh, uh, response, but maybe Jesse, do you want to start with uh, with what you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, look, we would love to partner uh, with Jewish schools um, on this kind of stuff. Just personally, I spent um, many years teaching in, in Jewish day schools, um, actually mostly around the New York area. Um, and like, I think, I think exactly what you're talking about is something those schools could really use. Um, so in terms of like specific things that we're doing um, and that, you know, we're continuing to do is trying to create uh, right now, sort of the first step is just creating the basic resources, right? Um, so talking, talking about, um, you know, digitizing images, creating, um, creating um, catalogs that are descriptive and helpful 
um, in terms of like telling you what the image is about, uh, what the object is, how it, how, how, how it can be contextualized more broadly, um, right? So sort of that, that kind of uh, fundamental, uh, just like, here's the thing, right? Without, without necessarily, and packaged in a way that it's accessible to someone who looks at it, but not, not necessarily wrapped in uh, a curriculum, right? Wrapped in, um, wrapped in uh, you know, the kind of ways that, can, that, that it can then easily be brought in um, to schools. So the next step, and this is you know, something that really needs to be done actively in, in partnership with um, people who want to use the materials. Um, and I you know I could think about ways I would have used it in my classroom, but you know, you want to, it needs to be a dialogue, um, right? Uh, I think that, I think that by, by creating those relationships is like really the first step alongside digitizing and, and uh, making the materials available. And, and then, and then once we have the relationship and the materials, we can talk about, okay, what can we do with this stuff that will be helpful to you? Great. One, one uh, early example I'll just reference. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, well, we could talk offline. Uh, we'd love to continue the conversation. Yeah. So I, I'd like to give the opportunity also to Joseph Fidanke from Panama, who actually heads the association in Panama, uh, to ask a question. Joe? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, David. Um, great. Uh, uh, great opportunity. Uh, it's, a, it's a bird's eye view to the museum, and, and, and I can't say I'm uh, now super excited to go to Washington. It gives me a good, uh, good excuse to, to go back. Um, I was curious, uh, Jeff, if, if you can give me some idea uh, to your visitors. Who are the visitors that are going to see, uh, the, that are going to, uh, see you? Uh, the constituents in terms of those two, two million people that are visiting, who are they? Uh, I would love to hear, and if you know a bit about their background, also in terms of, of, of religion, because it gives it. Uh, I think it's a perspective, an, an interesting perspective that we should, that we should, that, that we should take in mind as we embark on this on this journey and in, in, in back in Madrid. So I would love to hear a bit of insight into that. Yeah, great question. And. Um... Uh, we have done some uh, post-visit surveys and, and uh, 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 even uh, cold calling, you know, survey to, to define a market as we, we developed a new marketing plan last year, right before COVID, unfortunately, which, will, which we had to delay and, and redo. Um, uh, you know, quite clearly, uh, for people to want to come to a Museum of the Bible, they, most people have had some connection to the Bible. Uh, so... Um, you know, it's a, right now it's a paid museum. So, you know, I'd say the vast majority of our visitors are from, uh, from people that have a connection to the Bible in some form. Um, we do get some visitors who come from no faith background. They're just curious about the technology or, uh, and so that's been a part of our marketing is to emphasize that this is a different kind of museum and uh, worth seeing just kind of in its own right. Um, uh, and, um, but it is, you know, it's fair to say that the majority of our visitors come from a faith background, uh, with, with some connection to the Bible. Um, and, uh, age demographics tend to be, uh, uh, you know, your typical tourism groups to DC. So some of them are tour groups, some are kind of couples, retirees, but a lot of families also. And so we've developed programming, especially for families, uh, on a regular basis to encourage that um, return activity, especially for those within a couple hour drive of Washington. So we do, we do have a market that's national and, you know, people who come to Washington, the school groups that come to Washington, that's a big part of our, of our um, uh, visitor uh, demographic. But uh, especially during COVID, it's been very focused on the local market, you know, within a two hour drive. So that does raise, you know, a lot of programming issues, you know, we, we um, and sensitivities, because if you're coming from a faith background, you obviously have a personal connection with the Bible and are used to interacting with it in a certain way. Um, so we, we try to present a, uh, again, history stories impact in a very engaging way 
but also to be educational, that there's numerous cultures and people who have, who have inter interacted with and ben benefited from the Bible over time. And, and that just shows even more the broad impact and value of the Bible. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, we really intentionally try to expose people to a broader history uh, than their own you know, uh, particular tradition. Very good, thank you. All righty, well, we have time literally for one last question, a quick question and a, and a quick answer so that we stay on, on course in terms of timing. Anybody who wants to, to do that? Trying to go through this is a whole list here. Okay, I think everyone has been uh, impressed with the tour. And uh, as uh, Joe and Jacob and others said, you know, we're all looking forward to going back to DC and this year making sure to, to visit the museum. I have missed out on other occasions, but I can guarantee you that as soon as I can fly again to DC, I'll be making it. And I'm excited about the fact that we're gonna be able to collaborate God willing very, very soon in an intense manner with the Fundación Hispano Judía and our future museum here in Madrid in Spain. So looking forward and thank you again for the, the journey for this hour and for the road ahead. Uh, David, um, if I, this is Kathleen. Um, uh, thank you again for this opportunity. And everyone on the call, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we leave, I just wanted to um, pause for a moment. We have another member of our museum team, our chief executive for partner relations, Mr. John Sharp. And I just wanted to see if John had anything he would like to share with the group before we depart. And John may be figuring out his, his mute button. And just to give him a, a, a moment, um, we've been walking around. I think maybe you have noticed. Um, this is one of our, I wanted to give you a sense for one of our other um, experiences in our exhibits. This is what we call the World Jesus of Nazareth. It's a first century replica of Nazareth. We also have, I think some of you may have had the chance to see in the background, we have living history interpreters who are actually on site in period costume um, and their personalities and they interact with the guests. So it's a very much an immersion experience and one of the more um, popular exhibits we have here at the museum. Um, and so John, uh, we'll give one last chance for John. <laughs> okay, right. thank you Kathleen. And <laughs> Thank all of you. As, as you might be able to see, the background right now is uh, we have the Capitol. We can see from the sixth, fifth and sixth floor of the museum, the Capitol of the United States. It's uh, as you are experiencing location, location, location. Uh, and also just wanted to say that uh, it seems like God always brings beauty from ashes. And so our, we had an old building, which has been turned into a magnificent museum. And I think you'll find the same thing happen with your museum. And we are excited to partner with you, thrilled with what you're doing, and uh, really do want to link arms with you. So thanks for being with us today and doing this tour. Thanks, Kathleen and Jeff, for your capable leadership with us, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Speak to you very soon. Okay, thank and so thank you all. Um, and David, um, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch with you and follow up. And if anyone has any additional questions, we're more than happy to field those individually and one on one. So thank you again. And we do hope to see you soon in person when it's safe at Museum of the Bible. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>